Welcome back to this video podcast edition of 12 Days in March. This material was delivered during a series of live lectures at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. In these next two installments, we will focus on bone tumors for the USMLE Step 1 exam. The topic of this recording is multiple myeloma. In the following recording, we will focus on the common sarcomas. As with all presentations, a PDF of this recording is available at the 12 Days website. And as a reminder, 12 Days is now offering tutorial services. For anyone interested, details are available at the website. So um, the goal here with uh, the tumors are not to be exhaustive and quite frankly just the opposite because when you get to bone neoplasm, there's a lot of tumors, but you don't have to know all the bone tumors. And make no mistake about it, when we talk about bone mats are the most common, but the, the, the tumors, the only ones really I wanted to pull out were myeloma because there's so many derivatives of myeloma, I wanted to nail that one. Osteosarcoma versus Ewing sarcoma is an important distinction because those are the ones that are going to come after you on, so that's what we'll cover. All right, Matt, uh, most does this. There are other mnemonics for what are the lesions that metastasize to bone, but I just love BLT with a kosher pickle, breast, lung, thyroid, kidney, prostate, and I added the by Matt L. Most for myeloma, lymphoma, and what's the other one here, melanoma. Just uh, quickly on the metastases, you'll see this thing about blastic versus lytic versus both. What I want to say is the blastic one is really prostate. That's the one to be familiar with, and they'll generally give you the PSA. But the issue, um, blastic, is they're going to be described with, again, sclerosis, just like with osteopetrosis, sclerotic bone deformity. I just want to make that association. When you see sclerosis mentioned, it's bone formation, and in these instances, it's blastic. Lytic is just as it sounds. It makes holes in bones. We're going to start with myeloma, and myeloma is myeloma, but you have this kind of pre-myeloma, if you will, MGUS. So this MGUS is myeloma wannabe. It wants to get there. So what you really need to know is the distinction between MGUS and myeloma, and to understand MGUS, it helps you understand myeloma anyhow. So here's a protein phoresis, big schmeal. You can see here again, the big spike is always albumin. Far away from the albumin are the globulins. And you can see here, you go down IgG, IgA, IgM, kappa lambda, polyclonal representation of the globulin peak. So here's an M spike. This is now we have a monoclonal spike. It's narrow, it's high, and look now, they give us the phoresis. It's a IgG of a lambda type. So we have a monoclonal gammopathy. Now that doesn't tell us the patient has myeloma. It just tells us they have an increased amount of a monoclonal protein. So we have to figure out the difference between myeloma and just a gammopathy. So you've got to distinguish the two. You can answer this one because you guys are due for a question. These are all indications for ordering a protein for recess. So here the problem is you can order a lot of SPEPs and I promise you they're going to come back as with this spike. And it's like, oh, for crying out loud, I got this spike for the right reason, but did they have myeloma? No, not really. So what's the difference between MGUS and myeloma? So you have a small M spike. You don't have anemia. You don't have actually bone lesions. Your calcium's okay. And if you get to a bone marrow, which you never do, there's not that many plasma cells. So look at that. That's on the slide, and then I just retyped it right here. Low quantity, bone marrow works fine. The bones are intact, no focal lesions. You'd order a skeletal survey if you're really concerned. And look what I did also in terms of hypercalcemia, right? No hypercalcemia. Just to remind you again, it's cytokine mediated, and we'll cover that in a second, because that's one of the important derivatives associated with myeloma. So you have no cytokine mediated bone destruction, no hypercalcemia. So what do you do when you get somebody who has an M spike? Well, you get a CBC to make sure they don't have anemia. You get a calcium, make sure they don't have hypercalcemia, and we go from there. Just to let you know, MGUS, people, you say, oh, you got this monoclonal spike. Well, what's going to happen to me? 1% per year go on to develop a myeloproliferative disorder. Unimportant, they're not going to ask you. All righty, so if these are the criteria for MGUS, what are the criteria for myeloma? So here's the criteria. A lot of plasma cells. You have a high monoclonal protein, a high monoclonal spike, usually greater than 3 grams. One or more of the following. So here you have hypercalcemia. So your myeloma patients are going to have hypercalcemia, cytokine-mediated, kidney disease. 
There are three ways that myeloma gets the kidneys, and that's really why I'm including it, because here's myeloma overlapping with renal, and they like myeloma renal disease. So you can have a normochromic, normocytic anemia, and again, this issue of lytic bone lesions as assessed by skeletal surgery. So the way it's going to work, you order the SPEP, it's going to suck. As it came back, what are you going to do? You order all these tests to kind of keep an eye and sort out, is it MGUS or myeloma? These aren't questions for the boards. So here's a lady. I got this protein, pharesis, because she's annoying and has, like, everything wrong with her, and it came back. This is exactly how it comes back. That's a small spike. Remember, we said it's uh, three grams is myeloma. So this is abnormal, and then they write here, and we send patient the result. It's like, hey, you got an M spike, restricted band in the gamma region. Oh, here it is, IgG kappa monoclonal. It's like, shit, monoclonal, I got to go sort this out. So what am I going to do? I'm going to get a CBC, check, normal. I get a calcium creatinine, normal, check. I get a UA, she's not spilling any protein, check. So does she have MGUS or myeloma? She has MGUS, and we'll just follow it serially. She says, oh, am I going to get sick? Am I going to get myeloma? Yeah, 1% per year. Can happen quick enough. Just kidding. <laughs> so here we are. So now we just lapse from MGUS to myeloma. And so myeloma for the boards, it's like all those things we just said, but that lytic bone lesion is going to be that low back pain in the old guy. All right, low back pain, old guy on the boards, it's myeloma or metastatic prostate cancer. The other things they're going to do to make you know that it's not prostate cancer, they're going to tell you that it had rouleau formation. So we're familiar with, again, the idea of sed rate, red cells dropping. So the immunoglobulins negate the charges on red cells. They clump, they fall. Infection with encapsulated organisms. What's happening? Hey, I'm making all this protein. I'm making all this extra IgG. I shouldn't be getting sick. Well, the problem is you're not making any IgA or IgM, and the IgG may not be so good anyhow because it's of a monoclonal derivation. Increased risk of specifically strep pneumonia, encapsulated organisms, and then the other issue is they almost always have a creatinine of 2.1. Okay, that's your myeloma patient. In terms of cells that you need to know, I already told you, you need to know what these plasma cells look like. And this is one just chock full of immunoglobulins. I actually saw our question one year where they literally pointed to that and said, what is it? And the answer was a immunoglobulin. So here's the renal disease. All right, three renal disease. What I don't have here is renal disease secondary to hypercalcemia. So hypercalcemia, calcinosis of the kidney, is one of the mechanisms. But the other is amyloid, amyloid L, light chain. Uh, amyloid deposits in the kidney. Here they look to be in the glomeruli, but they deposit in the interstitium as well. So amyloid renal disease is one, and they're going to give you the Congo red stain and apple green uh, birefringens. The other thing is you're going to see the phrase cast nephropathy or amorphous eosinophilic material clogging the tubules. So the, the kidney disease comes from you can develop the casts. Casts are just a lot of proteins. So we secrete immunoglobulins or parts of immunoglobulins in the kidney sometime, and they're taken up by the proximal convoluted tubule. They're reabsorbed. But with myeloma, you're just secreting so many of them, the immunoglobulins that leak through, they themselves are toxic to the tubules in high amounts. So you can get toxicity to the tubules, or they can travel downstream, pick up some of that Tam Horsfeld glycoprotein, and create these casts. So obstructive downstream in the collecting tubules. So you just have to be familiar with the different ways that myeloma can affect the kidney. There's the punched out bone lesion, classic description that they'll use. And again, they like, is like his hypercalcemic. Here's your hypercalcemia options, parathyroid-related protein, activation of the macrophage or cytokines. And you just have to know, you know, there's no way, there's nothing intuitive about it. But in myeloma, it's from the release of cytokines. IL-1, remember that osteoclast activating factor. So increased IL-1 stimulates class. You get these punched out lesions and secondary hypercalcemia from rotting bone, okay? And that's just a summary about myeloma. So we touched base on all those things just now. So myeloma does have some good derivatives in there, and that's why it's worth paying attention to. And that concludes this discussion of multiple myeloma for the USMLE Step 1 exam. The next video picks up on osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, both of which are must-knows for the boards. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 days. Thank you.